Good morning, everybody. Good to see you today. I'm, uh, I'm appreciative of the fact that you, you came today and you're here. Thank you for braving uh, the inclement weather. And, uh, but I'm also thinking about those folks that are at home live streaming, uh, still in their flannel pajamas, wrapped up in their comfy little robe, drinking their second cup of coffee. I'd just like for you to know we're thinking about you and we wish you, we were with you this morning. It is great to have all of you today. The sun is shining and it's going to be warmer tomorrow. Is that a deal? You know what? I'm already tired from shivering this morning. But I, I did a little more than shivering. We got our garage door open and then it wouldn't close. And boy, what do you do when that happens? And uh, so we're I'm not mechanically inclined at all, uh, but we got out of the vehicle, parked in the driveway, went into the garage and pushed the little button on the wall there while I was hanging from the garage door. And I was just worried a neighbor was going to look over and say, honey, call 911. Pastor's frozen, stuck to his garage door this morning. <laughs> and after about four attempts, we got the garage door closed. And uh, so I'm, uh, I'm already put in a pretty, pretty hard day this morning. I, I just, uh, I'm glad I enjoy preaching and it energizes me instead of drains me today. Man, it's cold. It is cold. Uh, Pastor and I are southern, southern guys. Uh, you just can't change that. Southern born, southern bred. When we die, we'll be southern dead. That's just the way it is for us. And we, we feel it when we're in this kind of weather. We deal with it, but we feel it. It's cold out there. It's so cold, uh, an Amish man was seen buying an electric blanket. <laughs> Anything to get out of this cold. It was so cold, Dave, I saw a bunch of chickens heading toward Chick-fil-A saying, take me, take me. <laughs> Anything to get out of this cold. It's so cold, Starbucks is selling coffee on a stick this morning. Hey, those are pretty lame, I know, but that's the best the Internet has to offer. I'm sorry. <laughs> All right. Let's turn our attention, please, to Matthew's gospel, Matthew chapter 2, Matthew chapter 2. And uh, reading a little extra scripture this morning, I want you to, I want to get it all. I want you to see uh, how it entails the miraculous regarding the Christmas event. Look for those terms that cue you into the fact that this is all supernatural stuff going on here. Matthew chapter 2, verse 1, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, where is the one who has been born king of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed, and all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. In verse 5, in Bethlehem. In Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go. And search carefully for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me so that I too may go and worship him. Verse 9, after they heard the king, they went on their way and the star. They had seen when it rose went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. Is this not an erratic, bizarre acting star? And when they saw the star, in verse 10... They were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshiped him. And then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts 
of gold and frankincense and myrrh. Now, we don't know how many wise men or magi there were. The tradition is there were three, probably based on the fact there were three gifts presented to the Christ child, but we really don't know. But it appears there were at least three. And having been warned in a dream, a dream, not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. When they had gone, an angel, we got stars, we got dreams, we got angels going on. An angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, he said, take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt, stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. So he got up, took the child and his mother during the night and left for Egypt where he stayed until the death of Herod. And so was fulfilled what the Lord had said through the prophet, out of Egypt I called my son. When Herod realized that he had been outwitted by the Magi, he was furious, and he gave orders to kill all the boys in Bethlehem and its vicinity who were two years old and under in accordance with the time he had learned from the Magi. Then what was said through the prophet Jeremiah was fulfilled. And you'll see this throughout Matthew's gospel, Old Testament prophecies one after another, one after another being fulfilled in the person and in the events of Christ. Verse 18, a voice is heard in Ramah, weeping in great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children and refusing to be comforted because they are no more. Verse 19, Herod died, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt. And, and on the story goes with these elements of the supernatural compounded. Now here we are, once again, Christmas right around the corner, Christmas all around us, Christmas with its sights and sounds and celebrations. And many people associate Christmas with, with family and travel and food and parties and frenetic shopping. But most importantly, Christmas reminds us of the supernatural. I hope we won't forget that. Christmas reminds us that God is God, and God is sovereign, and God has stepped into history in miraculous ways to set the stage for the arrival of His one and only Son. And as we read this story, it becomes very clear that God is sovereign, that He is over all, and all answers to Him. All things are at His disposal. Kings and kings' decrees, stars and angels, dreams and visions are His instruments. Prophets and prophecies do His bidding. Now, there are Many things we could consider today, but let's streamline it and consider some of the basics here. Three supernatural signs that accompanied the birth of the Savior. And of course, the greatest sign was the baby itself, born of a virgin, son of man, son of God. But his coming, the coming of this baby was surrounded by supernatural evidences that all point to the uniqueness of this child. And in our text, we see three supernatural phenomena. Now, I'm very guarded about using that word miracle. I use it reservedly. I don't just throw it out there. One of my pet peeves, and I got a lot of pet peeves, by the way. Are you interested? No, I didn't think so. Okay, but I'll tell you anyway. <laughs> <laughs> one of my pet peeves, and maybe this one belongs to the very top of the list, is, is the number and length of commercials on television and radio. I just hate that. Another pet peeve is, some of you are here this morning, no doubt, people who don't turn right on red after stopping. <laughs> Loud music in restaurants. Cold coffee. Barking dogs, wolf blitzer, (laughs) socks that don't stay up, 
golf balls that don't go straight. That's what Pastor Brad uses. But another pet peeve I have in the theological realm is the overuse of the word miracle. We throw that word out there. And, you know, somebody gets a job, we call it a miracle. Somebody gets a good x-ray from the dentist, we call it a miracle. No, it's called brushing and flossing. We sell a house, miracle. More than likely, it's the matter of the housing market, supply and demand. To use the word miracle when there is no miracle really cheapens and undermines and compromises the word miracle. So when I use the word miracle, believe me, that's exactly what I'm talking about. God's intervention, the supernatural breaking into the natural order. Well, let's look at the miracles that surround this Christmas story. The miracles in our text. First of all, we've got the star. Oh, what a star it is. Look in verse 1. Jesus was born in Bethlehem during the time of King Herod. Magi from the east came, asked, Where is the one who has been born king of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. The star-struck magi are star-lit and star-led in their search for the baby. In verse 9, after they heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen when it rose went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. And when they saw the star, they were overjoyed. Now, some people like astrological gurus have tried to, tried to make more of this than it says, as if the alignment of the stars has predestined everything for everybody. And they've conjured up an astrological configuration, a, a predestined fate dictated by the stars which control all of our lives. And to that I say three words, baloney. And some have tried to make less of it than it says. They say it's merely an, just a natural phenomenon, a natural configuration of the stars. There's absolutely nothing miraculous about any of it. It was just an unusual alignment of the stars or the planets or a constellation or a comet. But I find that impossible to believe. If that is so, then why hasn't it repeated itself? If that is so, how do you explain this unusual, unpredictable behavior of this star? It acts like no other star. It gives every impression that it is being directed by something or somebody. This is not a normal star. This is not business as usual in the heavens. This star is so special, it sends out a very clear, specific message to the Magi. It gets their obsessive attention. It directs them. It seems to stop and start and shine its very specific light over its intended target, a manger in Bethlehem of all places, this insignificant little Bethlehem of Judea. What kind of star does that? What kind of star stops and goes? What kind of star illuminates the path one should go? What kind of star shines upon a particular object? Well, I submit only a star God sends. Somebody, let me put it in terms, gentlemen, you can understand. Somebody has a remote control in his hand. And that somebody is the one who created the heavens and all that is in it and created the earth and all that is in it. God knows all about stars. He created them and he named them, every one. Isaiah 40, verse 26 says, Lift your eyes and look to the heavens. Who created all these? He who brings out the starry host one by one, and calls them each by name. Because of his great power and mighty strength, not one of them is missing. The psalmist said in Psalm 147, verse 4, 
He determines the number of stars, of the stars, and calls them each by name. How appropriate that God would send signs from heaven to announce the coming of His Son who came to us from heaven. How appropriate that He would make His birth announcement by means of a star, considering His Son would be the light of the world. So we not only have a star, but secondly, let's move on. What else unfolds in the story? Secondly, and there will be a, there will be a test on this, so... Please do take notes. Secondly, there were the dreams. Dreams. And listen, not just one or two dreams, but multiple dreams in the Christmas story, not just to one or two people, but multiple personalities in the Christmas story were visited by God in dreams. Now, I don't believe that dreams are God's main means of communicating to people today. Don't assume because you have a dream that it's necessarily from God. Um, you know, late night pizzas can produce the same effect, or Mexican food is in pastor's case. Especially the kind of pizzas I like, hot, spicy. Any dream, prophecy, or even word of advice, or sermon must always be evaluated by the Word of God. He's put His Word in our hands, His Spirit in our hearts to guide us. And the two will never contradict. In the Christmas story, God uses dreams in one way, as one way of communicating His will. Now look at Matthew again, chapter 1 and verse 20. Or verse 19, after Herod died... Uh, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt, said, Get up, take the child and his mother, go to the land of Israel. For those who were trying to take the child's life are dead. Excuse me, that was chapter 2, verse 20. But chapter 1, verse 20 also, um, no, it doesn't. I, I was right to begin with. Okay. Uh, that's rare that I'm right to begin with. Chapter 2, verse 12, and having been warned in a dream... Not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. Verse 13, when they had gone and an trigger thought, my body will get into alignment with its untapped potential, and I will soar, I will fly like, like, a, like a hawk. Now try it. And then I can't get off the ground. Surely I can do this. I try it again, and I'm still tethered to terra firma. And the bitter realization sets in, it was a dream. It was just a dream. And I'm as tied to earth as I've always been. Oh, I'd love to be able to fly. If I could fly, I'd fly across the ocean. I'd fly over England where 70%, 76% of me comes from. I'd fly over Ireland where 13% of me comes from. I'd fly over Italy and Spain and France and over the mountains and over the seas. I'd fly around the world. I'd dream about it, but alas, it's only in my dreams. But here in the Christmas narrative, dreams take on a special meaning all of their own. Dreams meant something personal, profound, and powerful. Dreams were given by God to reveal His will. This was no ordinary dream. God's fingerprints are all over it. Look again in chapter 2 and verse 12. Having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. Now, for one thing, this dream is very clear and very specific. No interpreters are needed. They knew exactly what to do with this dream. They had no problem connecting the dots with this dream. God made it clear not to go back to Herod. And it says, so they returned to their country by another route. Something else about this dream that I've never noticed before, and I don't know if it's the case in all honesty, 
I'm not saying that it is, but I'm saying it seems to me it could be. Have you noticed that they all get the same message? Verse 12 says, these wise men, having been warned in a dream, it seems to me the implication is all of them were warned in a dream, and they all returned to their country. Not just, uh, I'm just not sure that they would have done that based on one man's dream. It seems possible they had all been given warning by God in a dream that night. Now, that's fascinating to me because in my life experience, my wife and I have never awakened to discover we've had the same dream. Now, wouldn't that just spook you if you got up, revealed the dream you had, and your spouse said, whoa, same here, same dream. I never have gotten up and said, honey, last night, I dreamed I fell into a vat of chocolate and was eating my way out. And then have her say, oh, I had the same dream. Really? Was it a purple vat with an orange rim around it? And were there multicolored sprinkles and marshmallows in the chocolate? And fairies dancing around it? and bagpipes playing in the background, and when you drank the chocolate, did it make you young and happy, and you also learned that you could sing like an opera star? Yes, the same dream. <laughs> Never had that happen. Well, it seems to me there were at least three wise men who had been given the same dream and the same warning. So in tandem, in unity, and in haste, they leave Bethlehem. They followed God's instructions, and they avoided the wicked, treacherous Herod. So we have stars. We have dreams. And then we have angels. Stars, dreams, and we've got angels here in chapter 2, verse 13. When they had gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Now, anti-supernaturalists dismiss angels as figments of imagination, leftovers from the dark ages, mythical inventions of the church. They would look upon you and me today with pity, suspicion, and incredulity. That, by the way, for my wife's cousin Ronnie, simply means disbelief. And they would ask us in condescending tones, do you really believe there is such a thing as angels? And I would be tempted to answer them in matching, condescending tones. Yes, I really do. Just like I believe in the Bible, just like I believe in the resurrection of Jesus, just like I believe the Holy Spirit is at work in the life of the believer today, just like I believe that when I die, I am going to heaven. I got a whole bunch of things I believe. And then I would say, what do you believe? And I've done that, and I've heard their answer. Oh, nothing really. You know, just, just man, just this, here and now, just what I can see. Well, I feel sorry for you <laughs> because there's so much more to life. This one? and the one to come that you can't see. I've never seen the wind, but I believe in it. I've never seen electricity, but I've been zapped by it. I've never seen love, but I've been zapped by that too. I've never seen hope, but I know it exists. And I believe God is good and wise and capable and has communicated to us in His world and in his word, and his word talks an awful lot about angels. In fact, angels at God's beck and call are quite busy during the birth of the Savior. Have you ever noticed that? Trace the steps of angels in Matthew and in Luke. In Luke's gospel, angels are everywhere. They just keep showing up. 
an angel. In fact, he identifies himself. His name is Gabriel, appeared to Zechariah, the father of John the Baptist. And he told John that he and his wife, even though they were very old, that they were going to have a baby, and that baby was going to be a boy, and that boy's name is going to be John, and John is going, John is going to be the forerunner and the announcer of the Messiah. Six months later, that same angel shows up in Nazareth and appeared to a virgin named Mary and told Mary she was going to have a baby and they should call the name of that baby Jesus and he will be called the Son of the Most High and he will reign and his kingdom will never end. And at Jesus' birth, angels... We are told an angel of the Lord appeared to shepherds and the glory of the Lord shone around them and they were afraid. And suddenly a great company of the heavenly hosts appeared with the angel praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest and on earth peace to all men. That's in Luke's gospel. Back here in Matthew, we're told that an angel appeared to Joseph in a dream and told Joseph that the baby Mary was carrying was conceived by the Holy Spirit, and his name will be called Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. And now in our text, an angel warns Joseph to escape to Egypt because Herod is crazy and he's on a killing rampage. Then the angel will come again and tell Joseph when it's safe to gather his family and come back to Israel. Hey, listen, angels are not eerie, creepy little ghosts. They're not tinkerbells that flutter over people's shoulders. They're not good luck charms or Christmas tree decorations. They are mighty ministers who come to fulfill God's assignments. In the Old Testament, one angel... Wiped out 186, 186,000 men. The Bible says he will give his angels charge over you. It asks the question, are they not ministering spirits sent to serve those who will inherit salvation? So take this home, stick it in your, 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 your Christmas stocking. You've got supernatural components in this story. What are you going to do with them? How are you going to deal with them? Stars, dreams, angels. What a story. Oh, what a God. What a Savior. All of this to tell the world about Jesus. To tell the world a Savior has been born. And listen, if you've missed that, you've missed everything important about Christmas. And if you've discovered that, you have discovered everything that's important about Christmas. Pray with me, would you? Hallelujah. Lord God, it never gets old. The old story never gets old. seems there's always something fresh and new and so inspiring to be discovered. Not little intricacies hidden away, but truths right there in front of us. Oh, God, God of stars, God of dreams, God of angels. I thank you for sending your son into this world that did not deserve it, and wrapping him up in the supernatural wrappings of stars and dreams and heaven-commissioned angels. Yes, we come. Yes, we bow. Yes, we adore. Yes, we worship the one you have sent. 